Good afternoon and welcome to the last panel of the conference, The Academy and the Pursuit of Peace and Human Rights. My name is Milena Stereo and I'm a professor at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law down the street and also have the pleasure of serving as managing director at the Public International Law and Policy Group, an organization that we will hear a lot about during this panel. The panel will be completely interactive. We have sat through a long two days of conferencing and it is time for a more interactive format. I hope you will all agree with me on that one. Um, instead, our esteemed panelists and I will engage in a series of questions and answers and a discussion about our general theme of how the Academy can influence and shape the pursuit of peace and contribute to the protection of human rights. Before we begin, allow me a brief moment to introduce the panelists. So let me start with Paul Williams to my left. Paul is a professor at the American University Washington College of Law and also at their School of International Affairs and also co-founder and president of the PILPG. Paul received his AB from the University of California, Davis, his JD from Stanford Law School and his PhD from the University of Cambridge where he was a Fulbright research scholar. Paul has given over 150 public lectures and presentations covering topics such as the Dayton peace negotiations, the Rambouillet negotiations, the dissolution of the former Soviet Union, the Nagorno-Karabakh crisis, and many, many others. He's the author of numerous law review articles and books, including his latest book, Lawyering Peace, which is being published by Cambridge University Press as we speak. Paul, is the book out yet? I signed it to my students. <laughs> so, and, 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 and any minute now, yes. Um, and to, to kind of make this a little bit more fun, I'm also going to share a random fun fact about each of our panelists. So Paul was once a blackjack dealer at a casino in Tahoe. <laughs> Next, we have Drew Mann. To, my, to, to, to the farthest left, no, 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 uh, this is not about politics at all, but <laughs> to my farthest left. Drew is a former State Department diplomat. Drew, Drew has served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Colombo, Sri Lanka, as Counselor for, for Political and Economic Affairs at the U.S. Embassy at The Hague, Netherlands, as Team Leader for the Provincial Reconstruction Team in Tikrit, Iraq, and also as an expert on mission to the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. Drew is a recipient of the American Foreign Service Association's 1994 Rifkin Award for Constructive Defense, Dissent Against U.S. Policy Towards Bosnia. The Rifkin Award honors individuals who have demonstrated the intellectual courage to challenge the system from within, to question the status quo, and take a stand, no matter the sensitivity of the issue or the consequences of their actions. Bravo, Drew. <laughs> a cum laude graduate of Wake Forest University and the University of Idaho College of Law, Drew clerk for the Honorable Paul Roney Jr. at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and practiced law in Tennessee, Washington, and Alaska before joining the Foreign Service. And a fun fact about Drew, Drew once worked at Tinkerbell's toy shop at Disney World. <laughs> Next, we have, uh, to my farthest right, we have Darren Johnson. Darren Johnson is an associate professor of law at Howard University School of Law and the director of the Master of Laws program. Darren received his BA from Yale College and his JD from Harvard Law School. Immediately following law school, he served as an honors attorney at the Pentagon. After departing the Pentagon, Darren continued to practice law as an attorney advisor in the U.S. State Department Legal Advisor's Office. In 2007, he served as the legal advisor to the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, Iraq. Darren also served on detail to the Office of the White House Counsel in 2011 and from 2011 to 2012 under President Obama. In addition to teaching international law, human rights, and national security courses at Howard, Darren also serves as a senior legal advisor at the PILPG, and he was, Darren was just named um, to the, um, Darren, you're going to have to help me with the title, to the International Law Advisory. To the uh, U.S. State Department Advisory Committee on International Law. So congratulations, Darren. And a fun fact about Darren is that he's an avid, avid comic book fan and has been collecting, collecting Marvel comics since he was young. He's also a Trekkie, Michael, and has seen every live action Star Trek movie and TV series. And last but certainly not least, Alex Kuick. Alex Kuick is a partner at the Robert Brown Immigration Law Firm in Cleveland and also an adjunct professor and director of the Immigration Law Clinic at Case Western Law School. He received his JD from 
my institution, the Cleveland Marshall School of Law. He also received a master's in business administration from Cleveland State University College of Business. Alex oversees the firm's litigation practice, focusing largely on removal and deportation defense matters and general litigation. And he's also well versed in the firm's family-based immigration practice. Alex is a graduate of Bowling Green State University, where he majored in international business and Russian language and culture. Um, and prior to his arrival at Robert Brown, his current law firm, Alex was a solo practitioner working in the field of general litigation and legal ethics. And a fun fact about Alex is that he loves to smoke meat. He has a meat smoker, and it's a hobby that he <laughs> uh, enjoys with his, with his father. OK, so we're going to start. The first question goes to Paul. So, Paul, the firm you founded with Dean Michael Scharf 25 years ago, the Public International Law and Policy Group, was born out of a desire of legal scholars to provide their advice and legal acumen to parties around the world on a pro bono basis. Can you discuss how PILPG harnessed the power of the academy during the early years and how that relationship has evolved over time? Sure. But first, Milena, you're a fun fact. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Put me in. Uh, fun fact, I have an identical twin sister who, if she took my spot at the podium, you guys would never know. So. <laughs> <laughs> and she may actually have taken your spot. Um, <laughs> thank you for your question, Milena. This, this gives me a chance to spend two or three minutes uh, on the origin story of PILPG. Uh, and the origin story is t titled Old Speckled Hen. Uh, and we'll get to a second why it's titled Old Spe Speckled Hen. And no, I have not been drinking Old Speckled Hens. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a mouthful to pronounce. Uh, when I was at Cambridge, I had left the Department of State, and I was writing op-eds and the modern-day version of, of blog posting and whatnot. And the Bosnians reached out to me and said, would you like to come to Dayton, Ohio, uh, at the Wright-Patterson Air Base and be our legal advisor, our lawyer? during the peace negotiations. And I was like, sure, sounds like fun, but don't you have lawyers? It's like, we have tons of lawyers. We've just never done peace negotiations before. We've never negotiated ceasefires, power sharing arrangements, transitional justice arrangements. Uh, so why don't you pop out to Dayton? Uh, and while I was there, I, on my way, I called Michael and I said, Mike, guess what? I'm going to Dayton, and you're going to help me <laughs> help the Bosnians negotiate uh, the Dayton Peace Accords. And Mike, can you call a few friends as well? Because we might need a lot of help. Uh, and so while I was at Dayton, Michael was, was in, uh, in Boston and organizing a number of uh, former Department of State uh, lawyers. Mike and I had spent time in the legal office uh, before heading off to, uh, to academia. And after I left uh, the Dayton Accords, I went back to London and the Macedonian uh, ambassador, and now we can say the North Macedonian ambassador, uh, bumped into me at a reception at a Croatian uh, National Day reception and said, we'd love to have you and your firm uh, provide some advice to President Gligorov on our negotiations with the Greeks. So I called Michael and I said, Michael, guess what? We have a firm. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, we do? And I'm like, yes, us and our friends uh, who are in academia. And my wife at the time was working for Accenture, uh, and we had a flat in Windsor, and across the street was the Round Hill Pub, which served Old Speckled Hen. And we went for a pint or two, uh, or three, and we spent the evening discussing how we could create a global pro bono law firm. And my wife had two pieces of advice, well, three pieces. She said, call Michael, uh, call your other friends, call Drew, get Drew to be your strategic advisor, uh, do it for free because you're 29 years old and no one's really going to pay you <laughs> to do peace negotiations and post-conflict transitional justice and come up with a really long name that no one can really remember but sounds serious, hence Public International Law and Policy Group. And what we realized is that there were so many academicians at Cambridge University and other universities in the UK that were looking to launch a career teaching, but also wanting to practice international law. And I think Darren will talk some more about that as well, the praxis uh, of peace. Uh, and then secondly, that there was this cadre of former foreign office or State Department lawyers who moved into academia and really missed practicing public international law. And so over the last quarter of a century, Mike and Drew and Darren and Melaine and I have worked to basically harness this intense intellectual power that Mike Newton and others were talking about this morning to basically do peace talks, post-conflict constitutions, and prosecuting war criminals. 
So that's our origin story. <laughs> Yes, and um, I am, you know, as Paul mentioned, Darren, Drew, um, and I have all been um, heavily involved with the PLPG over the years, and it is truly a wonderful organization. So a little plug for the PLPG. Um, Paul, in addition to running the PLPG, you also run the renowned Lawyering Peace Program at American University's Washington College of Law, where you teach and train the next generation of public international lawyers and policymakers. How do you foresee the intersection of academia and the pursuit of peace and human rights evolving in the coming decade when your students help lead the field? We can all retire in the coming decade. <laughs> One of the things that uh, the advantages of doing this type of practicing of public international law from the academy is that you can train the next generation. You know, everyone talks about Oh, the next generation. And we all have had these conversations. You say the word millennial, and I know what you're all thinking. <laughs> There's this whole sort of you know, collage of ideas and thoughts. But one of the opportunities as an academic is to be able to help to train and to shape and develop the skills, or at least identify the skills that these young professionals might be interested in developing so that they can have their impact on the world and the way that they see best to have that impact. Uh, there's a huge interest, as we all know, and we'll hear about um, from our colleague, uh, Alex, on the immigration clinic, real practical skills. And if you can teach students practical skills while you're helping them negotiate ceasefires for clients, or they're helping you draft ceasefires for clients, and Jim Johnson talked about it this morning as well, you know, having those interns, having those stagiaires, uh, those students helping to basically do real world work out there that makes an impact, but developing skills that can transfer to a firm, to the State Department, to another foreign ministry. Uh, we've, uh, what I love about LinkedIn is you can track your, your web of influence. Uh, there's 900, between Michael, Milena, myself, Darren, we have 900 alumni out there that have gone through some form of lawyering peace or the Yemen Accountability Project or the work that Milena does at, at Cleveland Marshall. And you can sit back and see that amplifying effect of just a half a dozen professors, but over the years continuing to build uh, that skill set and that network of students, and then they network on the network on the network. It's like that old Fabergé commercial. They tell two friends and they tell two friends. And so that's one of the things that, that we all bought into early on, building that cohort, building that cadre of young professionals that will then go out and make the world a better place, however they see fit. Thanks, Paul. The next question is for Darren. Darren, can you talk a little bit about the interplay between academic theory and the practice in the peace and human rights space? How does this, how has this interplay manifested in your own work at the State Department, at the White House, or also at the PLPG? Great. Thank you so much, Milena. Um, and if I could just uh, take a point of privilege to uh, thank uh, Dean Scharf uh, for the wonderful opportunity to be here uh, celebrating the Cox Center's 30th anniversary uh, and PLPG's 25th. Um, and uh, thank as well uh, Paul Williams for the invitation. I also wanted to just take a moment to reflect on, uh, for me personally, how wonderful it is to be here at Case Western. I actually have a, a familial link uh, to the institution. My maternal great-grandfather a century ago, uh, in 1919, left Georgia to come to what was then Case Institute of Technology uh, to study chemistry um, before returning back home and marrying my uh, great-grandmother uh, and starting our family. So it's, it's kind of a full circle moment for me to be here at Case Western, knowing that he was just here a century ago studying. So I wanted to just uh, acknowledge him in this moment. Um, Milena, to, to return to your question, you asked about um, the interplay between academic theory and practice uh, in the peace and human rights space. And, you know, we've heard, we've heard a lot about this interplay between academic theory and practice from uh, the various uh, panels uh, that have been held today. But I'd like to just take a moment to focus on um, the deep body of scholarship that academics have produced over the last uh, last several decades, right, in the fields of peace building, human rights, and transitional justice. Um, and in particular, uh, as it relates to the work of PILPG and some of the work that I'll mention um, that I've been engaged in, international scholars have really developed some very advanced um, intricate theories on best practices 
right, in areas such as peace negotiation, best practices in the field of post-conflict constitution making and constitutional design, as well as human rights accountability. And as Paul mentioned, I like to refer to these applicable theories as contributing to the praxis of peace, right, or the practice of peace, the, the work that um, many folks at PLPG and other practitioners are engaged in in the field. Um, Milena, you asked a bit about how this, how these theories and this interplay between academic theory and practice has related to my own work, and so I'll, you know I'll just touch on my own introduction uh, to this field. Is is uh, Milena mentioned? You know, while I was at the State Department, mm -hmm. I spent um, a year serving as legal advisor in Baghdad, our embassy legal advisor, and it was actually in that capacity that I really started to become engaged in issues involving post-conflict transitional justice, right? One of our uh, embassy responsibilities was to help um, uh, the Iraqi citizens to stand up new legislative mechanisms implementing uh, new uh, provisions within their reform constitution, right? And so I was very deeply enmeshed in issues such as electoral reform, um, vetting, debathification, uh, how, we, how the um, international criminal accountability would be addressed domestically. And so as we were working on these issues within the embassy, we drew largely from the scholarship, right, that other scholars had produced um, in similar contexts. And the same thing happened later, right, in my time when I returned to the State Department. I had the privilege of uh, serving as a senior official in an office that was stood up specifically to support the Arab Spring transitions. Right? And so a significant part of that support was supporting the constitutional reform processes that were unfolding in a number of those countries. And again, we drew from the scholarship and the great scholarly work that had been done around questions of constitutional reform in post-conflict environments. And the, the interplay that you know, I myself have had the privilege of seeing you know, both at the State Department and then later at PILPG where Paul, Malena, and I, and Drew have, you know, had the opportunity to work on so many exciting issues, and, and Michael as well as, um, including issues such as the, uh, the peace process in Sudan, right? And so in all of these efforts, we're drawing from these best practices, and the interplay becomes exciting because not only are we drawing from these best practices, right, but as uh, scholars and practitioners, we're drawing from... Um, the experiences that we have in the field and our experiences are going back into the uh, body of scholarly work uh, that contributes to the praxis of peace. So there's this very synergistic interplay between application of these theories and practice and then transformation and evolution of the theories through the scholarly work of uh, many associated with PIOPG. Thank you, Darren. And we will return to this theme of the interplay between theory and practice, and we'll talk a little bit more about the work of the PLPD as well. But I wanted to turn to Drew next. So, Drew, you have long been engaged with the work of the PLPG, most recently as its strategic advisor. In 2018, you were a senior legal advisor to PLPG's Rohingya documentation mission in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. The U.S. government funded and guided the project in order to understand what happened to the Rohingya and to make a determination of whether policy action should be taken. Can you speak a bit about the methodology used when documenting these atrocities, particularly the approach you and the team took when dealing with sexual and gender-based violence? Thank you, Milena. Thank you, Milena. Um, First of all, just a brief recap of what was happening uh, to the Rohingya in late, mid-2016, the government uh, started to increase actions against the Muslim minority um, in the North Rakhine state on the southwest border of, um, of Myanmar, Burma, um, adjacent to Bangladesh. This started uh, refugee flows. There were extreme abuses and whatnot driving people out of their homes. Uh, it exacerbated a, uh, after a uh, is insurgents attack in August 2017 to the point where hundreds of thousands of Rohingya left their home and moved to camps in Bangladesh. 
Cox's Bazaar area. The State Department decided to fund a study to find out exactly what had happened. Um, in order to make a study, to conduct a study that was objective, credible, neutral, and transparent, and one that would withstand claims of cherry-picking stories and bias, um, the State Department, along with PILPG, developed a methodology in order to uh, obtain the information, conduct interviews, and do an assessment of the information that was received. The methodology is very important in order for the report and its conclusions to be credible. In fact, they were key for the State Department to be able to make some determination about what had occurred in uh, Burma at the time of these actions, as well as providing uh, information and support for subsequent determinations and efforts by the International Criminal Court and the um, U.S. Uh, Human Rights Council. So the purpose was to get an accurate understanding of what had happened in Myanmar. And in order to uh, be able to sort out any patterns that would be able to justify a finding of uh, serious human rights abuses. In order to do that, PILPG, along with uh, the State Department, happened on and developed a methodology which entailed the use of experienced investigators. We had, we ultimately found 18 international investigators, 18 from 11 countries around the world, which ensured uh, gender and regional geographic diversity. We used those investigators to ensure that they would conduct randomly selected individuals throughout the camps in Cox's Bazaar. There are over 40 camps and settlement areas in Cox's Bazaar. Ultimately, the 18 investigators were able to cover 34 um, interview, interview in 34 of the 40 places. We used modern polling and statistical um, techniques such as um, skip patterns so that uh, you would make sure that the investigators' paths did not cross, so you did not cover the same people. We ensured skip patterns to make sure that a wide range of areas were covered. We would go into a household. We would ask permission to, to conduct the interview. We would get confirmation of an informed consent by the household. We would then use a polling sampling called a uh, random birth date to be able to select the person within the household we would talk to because oftentimes it would be the senior male who would want to talk to us or the person who had the good story. Well, that would not ensure a random selection and a credible basis for drawing conclusions. So we used the random birthday selection. We were only talking to people over the age of 18 in order to ensure that the informed consent would not uh, involve uh, young people. Um, we were talking to people who had only left Myanmar, fled Myanmar, after October of 2016. There had been successive waves of Myanmar refugees staying in uh, Bangladesh. They go back at least to 1992. Um, we were seeking only first-hand accounts. It wasn't good enough for somebody to say, well, I heard my next door neighbor say. We were only looking for first-hand accounts. We were not going to document hearsay. We were using a standardized interview format, a questionnaire that had been refined over a number of years so that we would be able to elicit information that would allow us to draw conclusions. And at the end of each day, we would code. We would take the information that was received and we would try and break it up into perpetrators, victims, witnesses, um, events, what had happened, the location, and all of those would be identified by a number, a given a code, which would then make it easy to ultimately process the information. And it was by coding and looking at the information in an aggregate that we were able to discer discern various patterns of serious human rights abuses. That's generally the methodology that we used. 
As for sexual and gender-based violence, this was an overwhelming concern because we were aware from media and NGO reports within the camp that serious uh, violations of these sorts had occurred. The interviewers who were selected obviously were experienced in terrible traumas and so brought an awareness of how to deal with uh, individuals who had received and been the victims of such violence. We ensured there was gender diversity in the interviewing team. We had over, uh, just over 50% of our interviewers were female. We had an overwhelming number of uh, female interpreters. And so we ensured that every team that went out had at least one female interpreter and or one female uh, investigator in order to make sure that uh, gender considerations were taken, taken care of. We tried to prepare both the interpreters and the investigators during the investigation, during the training, of what to expect and how to handle uh, issues of SGBV during an interview. We also provided social psycho support, both to the interviewers and the interpreters, to ensure they retained awareness and they knew how to deal with um, these sorts of incidents as, as they came up. We also had each investigator be aware of the resources that were available within the camps for social, human, medical, psychological uh, care so that we wanted to minimize any re-victimization that had occurred by the people we interviewed. With all of that, we were aware that even with the large number of incidents we were able to um, get from the witnesses and the victims, we were probably still underreporting the information. The questionnaire we had in that sense was a little bit rigid and did not permit enough of uh, follow-up questions and, and getting additional information to allow us to make a uh, full examination of that project. But still, um, I think we were able to bring together sufficient information to make claims that s serious crimes had been committed involving sexual and gender-based violence. Drew, um, follow-up question to you. Um, ultimately, the PLPG drafted and issued a report called Documenting Atrocity Crimes Committed Against the Rohingya in, Myan in Myanmar's Rakhine State, in which, um, and in that report, uh, the PLPG concluded that there were, there was credible evidence that serious violations had been committed against the um, Rohingya um, ethnic group in uh, Myanmar. What kind of a, this is a question for you, Drew, um, what kind of a role do you see that report as, as playing? And also, what do you think of the U.S. government's response or lack thereof since the report's release, which was a few years ago now? Right, 19, uh, 2018, the report was released. Um, first of all, the report itself was uh, brought about by an intersection of um, exactly the academe, the legal professionals, the um, legal practitioners, the, the government. It was an accumulation of all of their efforts. Uh, the process and methodology was created by PILPG and the U.S. government. Um, it was implemented by people who were involved with NGOs and legal practitioners. Uh, the report was developed by NGOs, academics, legal practitioners, and of course, it ultimately went to the government for its own policy considerations and its own determination. And through publicity and continued outreach, to we were able to engage academics and the media and governments in order to heighten awareness of what had happened and hopefully influence people's um, actions and government policies. So the report itself was able to bring together exactly the site, sort of um, policy groups that can influence human rights um, and try to give them a direction for them in order to address what had happened against the Rohingya. As for the United States government's response, remember the, the uh, report itself was funded and was de the methodology developed by the United States government. So in, in effect, the United States government did a remarkable job. This was during the sort of the beginning, middle 
of the Trump administration. So we need to remember that uh, they made a significant contribution to raising awareness as well as highlighting the abuses that had occurred. Um, this wasn't the first time there had been significant documentation of human rights abuses by the United States government. Of course, there's the annual human rights report, which every embassy in the world contributes to. Um, there was also, in the 1992 and 1993 uh, Yugoslav conflict, effort by uh, embassy officials and refugee officers around the world, but primarily in Europe, to collect statements of people who had suffered uh, during that conflict, which were then provided to the UN's uh, Commission of Experts, which ultimately found, formed the basis for the information that was passed to the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal. And um, one of my jobs when I was there was to help sift, lead a team to sift through the information to be able to uh, develop initial case files so that we knew whom we should start targeting with our investigation and prosecutions. Um, and then in 2004, there was an effort by the State Department to fund a mission very much like the Rohingya mission to look at what had happened in Darfur. Um, this ultimately led to a report which influenced Secretary Powell um, when he decided to identify what it was happening in Darfur as genocide. In 2011, the State Department also funded a study involving what was happening in South Sudan. That mission was cut short, and Secretary Clinton used the findings, the incomplete findings, for her private diplomacy. She didn't choose to make it public. So in 2008, the Rohingya report and the Rohingya mission was done at the behest of the United States government. Um, we also had Ambassador Brownback the ambassador for religious freedom, visit the camps, talk with the investigation team, and use a press conference to address what had happened there. Uh, there was an official reaction by the United States government, the Treasury, in uh, August, uh, in August of 2018, uh, sanctioned four military commanders and two military units. Uh, based on the findings of the report, the State Department issued its analysis of the data we had collected um, and called into question uh, serious human rights abuses that had occurred. Uh, it does, however, fall short. Um, my understanding is there was a memo sent up to Secretary, um, Secretary of State, to Pompeo, to make a determination of crimes against humanity occurring uh, in the, against the Rohingya. Um, unfortunately, Politico in late August of 2018 leaked that the memo was in front of Pompeo and uh, reportedly in a fit of pique um, because uh, his, his news had been, had been leaked and he wasn't going to be able to make a significant announcement. He decided not to make the determination and ultimately the report that did come out by the State Department did not make a determination about crimes against humanity uh, genocide or war crimes. So um, it didn't go far enough, but the emphasis is there. And I believe the current administration, the Biden administration, is reviewing the findings of the Rohingya mission and is struggling whether they want to uh, reinvigorate an examination of it and whether they are going to make those calls. Thank you. Now, I do have several questions for Alex as well about his practice in the immigration um, area. But before we move on to immigration, I wanted to give Paul and Darren the opportunity to weigh. And I see that Paul is writing notes furiously. <laughs> so, Paul, why don't, why don't you start? Thank you, Milena. No, I just wanted to, uh, to weigh in on this notion of of lawyers having an impact on on public policy, and it's one of the things that I've you know I've been surprised by. You know, I, I grew up in in Silicon Valley, and if it's like if you're calling the lawyers, it, it meant there was a contract dispute, there was a real estate dispute, there was some issue. Uh, but in Washington D.C. and then the practice that we've developed globally, uh, I've been very surprised that our our clients will our pro bono clients will ask, well, well, what's the legal basis, uh, or if we're working um, testifying on the Hill or or, or uh, engaging in other type of public advocacy, engaging with the journalist, what's the legal basis? You know, what are the legal requirements of a, of a crime against humanity? Uh, or what is the legal obligation to, to prosecute individuals? Or what legal authority does the Security Council? And it's very surprising because we oftentimes, when I'm working with my young professional team, uh, they'll hear a lot of, well, you know, international law, is it really law, et cetera, et cetera. But out there in the quote unquote 
real world, the clients, the governments, those negotiating peace agreements, those clearly, those setting up tribunals, um, are deeply interested in what the law is. And this is something that Mike Newton said early this morning, which is, is useful for people to keep in their heads for young professionals as they go through their careers. Lawyers don't make the law. They advise and assist others who may then make the law make treaties, uh, engage in state practice. And Mike was very honest. You know, if you're, if you're working for a client, you, you shape and you interpret the law. Um, but if you've got clients on all sides shaping and interpreting, then you can get a full picture of what the law looks like. And as an academician, writing those law review articles, Ali, that your, <laughs> none of your fellow students want to write, is all about articulating what the law is and what the law could be. And I've been very surprised in a refreshing way uh, working with the pro bono clients that they really want to know what the law is. And then that gives them the extra spring in their step or the extra quiver, quiver in their arrow in their quiver for uh, their policy making, policy shaping uh, arguments. And so I've learned uh, to not underestimate the power of the law and to not underestimate the obligation to accurately articulate the law before you start trying to shape it or evolve it. Yeah, and, and actually this, this one is for the students, but I'm going to jump, jump in real quick here. Paul and I once talked about this, and Paul said to me, you know, for our students, the value added as a lawyer is that we actually read the documents. You know, so, 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 so to know what the law is, you actually have to read the treaty, or you have to read the UN Charter, or you have to read some policy memo. So our value added is that we actually read the documents, in, in addition to many other things, right? Um, you, Drew, the diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> um, Darren, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, it's interesting in thinking of, about this question of the role of lawyers, right, and the role of lawyers in working with policy clients or pro bono clients. Um, I think an interesting analogy uh, when we think about the work of practitioners in this space um, where, where practice, right, and, you know, different scenarios help to shape um, our understanding of the law as implemented, you know, I, I think is as as law students, you know, you can almost think about this um, engagement between practice and scholarship is almost building our own bodies of common law, right? So you're, you're often in the classroom and you see how case to case um, with just a slight change in facts, you know, the law evolves. And so when we're thinking about this praxis of peace, right, and how these theories of constitutional design or constitution making or negotiation of peace agreements, they really build on practice, right, and the stories of um, what, what evolves in a particular context, right? So what happened in the Dayton Peace Accords may be slightly different than what happened in the uh, comprehensive peace agreement in Sudan or what happened in the constitution-making process in Egypt is going to be a little bit different than the constitution-making process in Tunisia. And so as scholars and as practitioners, each time you write about these incidents, right, you're building kind of this broader body of common law, right, of the praxis of peace. And I think that's one of the really exciting things um, that practitioners in this space get to do, um, and to, to link it back to what Paul says, that's what the clients are looking for, right? They're really looking for you to be knowledgeable about the best practice in the field. And as practitioners, we can play a very important role in feeding back into um, th that evolving understanding of the law. I just want to mention a couple of areas in which um, uh, folks affiliated with PLPG have done just that. So. Um, Milena mentioned earlier a book that she, Michael Scharf, and, and Paul um, all uh, co-authored on the Syrian conflict, right, and the impact that the Syrian conflict had on our understandings of international law, right? That's building to this broader understanding of the praxis of peace. Um, PLPG last year put out a research handbook on um, post-conflict state building, right, informed by um, various uh, contributions um, from from folks in PLPG and otherwise. And so we've got this great um, body of scholars who are constantly um, doing this work and taking best practices from their work and contributing to this, this broader uh, common law uh, of the praxis of peace. Go ahead, Drew. Um, you also have to realize 
the policymakers, the people you're going to be talking to, hopefully you're going to be influenced, they don't have the time to have devoted the attention to the issue that you will. Um, if you'll get in to see a senior official, uh, you might have 15 minutes, you might have a half hour to deal with a particular point of view. There'll be other people involved there. They may have different points of view. And the senior policymaker is going to need to hear from those of you with specific information, specific knowledge, to be able to draw on that information to help this person, the policymaker, make the decision. So it's it's going to behoove you, as they say, to read the documents, to make sure you have all of the information, because quite frankly, the policymaker won't have time to have done all of that. Thank you. Now, one of the important policy issues right now is immigration. And so for the next three or four questions, I'm going to go to Alex and ask him about his practice as an adjunct professor of law, the director of immigration of the immigration clinic here at Case Law School, and also his experience as an immigration law practitioner. Alex, how has your experience as a professor and clinic director shaped your legal practice? Or you know, would it be more accurate to say that your legal practice has shaped the way that you approach working with students? Yeah, so thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I would say they've impacted each other. Um, when I was asked to start working in the clinic and take it over, I, I didn't know how to, I mean, I'm, admittedly, I'm the least academic of everyone up here, <laughs> right? But I've been practicing immigration law you know, for now for over 16 years. So I know immigration law. I am a partner at a firm here in Cleveland. We have offices in four other cities, and I run the Cleveland office. So I know how to run an office. I know how to train attorneys. I don't know how to be a professor by any stretch of the imagination. So when I came in to kind of take over the clinic, my, my theory, at least my idea was, when you're running a clinic, you're teaching, run it like a law firm, right? Uh, immigration law, think about it like a three-legged stool. There's family immigration law, which consists of asylum law, refugee law, citizenship, green cards. There's employment immigration. You're bringing over scientists, engineers, athletes. I do a lot of rock band tours, so fun stuff like that. And then there's deportation defense, people being removed from the United States and appearing in front of the immigration courts. And so you take this three-legged stool and you want to apply it to an immigration clinic at a law school. How do you kind of develop that? So when I, when I took over, if I, if I remember right, it was February 2016, I think we had four or five cases. Professor Cuffer actually hired me. So <laughs> we had like four or five cases. And immigration laws, I'm very, very high volume practice. In my practice now, I probably have over 500, 600 cases under my belt right now, right? But to the extent it's high volume, it's kind of a hurry up and wait. Get everything filed, get meet your deadlines, and then you kind of go into the slow immigration process, you know, however long it takes. So it's, when I say it's high volume, it is high volume, but a lot of these cases take a long time to get done. So I mean, I'm happily to say, like last semester, I think we represented 27 clients in our clinic. Um, and these are people who are you know, low income, unable to get legal representation, people who are detained. It's important, right? And as kind of we talk about this whole human rights thing, we might maybe questions later about kind of how this immigration court system is set up, right? It's, you have a huge swath of people who are unrepresented here. And you know, my background was in ethics before I became an immigration attorney. And immigration law has a horrible reputation for really bad lawyering. And so that's another kind of thing I wanted to teach these students is, you know, I always tell them the story that when I first started practicing, I had this guy came into my office and offered me $50,000 cash to make up an asylum statement for him. And I always remember this, and I was like, oh, that's a lot of money. Are these student loans I got to pay? I think, admittedly, it crossed my mind. Like, that's a lot of money, right? But you can't, right? You guys are, I mean, those of you who are students here, you know, you're working so hard to get to this point, and you can lose your reputation and everything like that, right? And so these are the kind of the, I don't want to say the things, but these are the kind of the aspects I brought to a clinic was to run it like this. Um, has it impacted me vice versa? It has. I mean, I will say that I have, you know, when, when you are teaching, I guess the, the the best part of teaching is you're teaching yourself kind of over and over what you already know. Um, one of my roles as a, as a partner is I also train our attorneys when we sh you know, send them off to another city or if they stay in Cleveland, I train them. And I think this kind of role that I've actually developed here at Case Western has really, really changed my ability to actually train newer attorneys. And they were bringing up earlier the next generation, right? Not saying that my way is the best way to do it, but I think it's, <laughs> it's better than most. So. 
Great. Now, you, as you mentioned, you've practiced um, exclusively in immigration law for over 16 years, focusing a lot on removal defense in immigration courts. For those individuals that the U.S. government seeks to remove from the United States, what issues, you know, be it basic safeguards or fundamental fairness, do you see in the immigration court system in the United States? Yeah. So to kind of give you a little bit of background or kind of a 20,000 foot view of immigration court, it's not a real court. I mean, we call it a court. It's a court by name, but it's not really a court. It's a court that is a non-independent court that falls under the Department of Justice. So you have the Attorney General, you have the Department of Justice, you have a division called the Executive Office Immigration Review, EOIR, that is the immigration court system. Underneath that, you have essentially two levels of courts. You have immigration judges and you have an appellate court. Um, you know, during the Trump administration, for example, they hired, a, I want to say, 185 judges around the country, and like 90% of them were former ICE prosecutors, or they were uh, attorneys for the U.S. government and the military. Um, those ICE prosecutors, the chief judge of the immigration court system was the head of ICE, their legal division, and his deputy was the, the assistant chief judge. So essentially, you took one party in this proceedings, you made their two leaders the head of a court system, and then you kind of filled in the gaps in the next attorneys. Um, the immigration court system is seriously flawed in that it is designed for the person being removed to fail. Uh, there's no right to counsel. So you have no legal right to counsel. There are no you know, federal pro bono groups that are able to help people. Uh, you do have a right to a interpreter, assuming they can find one. So let's say you, are, you speak, I don't know, mom, and there aren't many mom speakers around here who can kind of show up and interpret, and you're detained, you're going to stay detained until they find an interpreter. Uh, we have something in immigration law called mandatory detention. So something small as... I'm not trying to limit or belittle this conviction, but something as small as drug paraphernalia will render you mandatory detention, irrespective of your family background, your family plight, any issues you have. You sit in jail the entire time. And if you don't have an attorney, you're going forward and fighting for yourself. Um, so you have these issues like this. You have a lack of you have a lack of immigration attorneys. I mean, there really is. There's not very many. It's a very small kind of niche group. And you know, you have these court systems. I think we have 55 immigration courts around the country. Um, when the Trump administration started, there was a backlog of 535,000. They hired 100 some judges, and we have a backlog of 1.2 million now. So by hiring more judges, you have a bigger backlog. You have a court system that has a detention facilities essentially built in that are run by private enterprises. I mean, you, can buy, you can buy stock in you know, the, the two big jails that are running all the immigration facilities. I mean, they're, they're publicly traded companies. Um, so you know, a lack of representation, a lack of fundamental fairness. And you have judges. You know, the University of Syracuse does a report called Track. It comes out every year and it ranks all these immigration judges around the country. We have a judge in Cleveland who got transferred here from Houston who has denied 100% of his asylum cases over the past three years. It's incredible, right? I mean, 100%. You're, why, why bother going to court, right, at that point? You're going to get denied. Um, you know, Cleveland, the easiest judge denies 82%. Like, you pull that judge, you're like, wow, I got an 18% chance to win. This is great. So... Think about that system. You know, where, where, what other court system do you have that? And I think the biggest, biggest flaw is the lack of independence in the immigration court system is that the attorney general runs the, the immigration court system like a dictatorship. So to give you an example, the, what essentially what they can do is in a normal court, you have precedent. You have years of court precedent. You have a lower court level. You have a dis, you know, circuit level. And you have Supreme Court making decisions. Immigration court, we have that too. Right? We have the immigration court and we have an appellate court that makes decisions. An attorney general can, can, can come in and just say, I don't like this precedent. I'm changing it. Uh, Jeff Sessions did it like seven times his first few months as an attorney general. And essentially, there was a case called Matter of ARCG, which was a asylum-based claim saying that women who are victims of domestic violence and who are unable to leave the relationship are what's called a particular social group for purpose of asylum. It took forever to get to this point. 2016, Jeff Sessions comes in and is like, no, we're not doing this anymore. And by a written decision, stripped it away. Two months ago, Attorney General Garland is like, oh, we're going to go back to the old way it was. So while it helps us as practitioners, we like this, right? We want to go back to the way it was before. Do we really want a system where whoever the, however the kind of political winds change, we have someone going in there just stripping precedent from one way or the other? And it's actually happened. It's done. You know, Garland has already stripped away, I think, four cases, if I remember right, that... Sessions overturned, which are 
precedent before. So it's kind of going, this is just back and forth. So the lack of independence, you know, when they talk about a broken immigration system. It's, it's shattered. And the court system shattered. And it's, you know, for all the court packing talk that we heard during the elections, you know, they hired 90% of all their judges are, you know, ICE prosecutors are going to be working for judges now. Wow. Or earlier in the day, we were, you know, struggling to find some positive themes and no, optimism. Sorry. I get a sense we're not going to get any sorry, <laughs> when sorry we talk that. about immigration. No, no, no. But thank, thank yeah. you so much for that insight. Um, Alex, one more question for you. Um, under the Trump administration, it was well documented that immigration, both legal and illegal, was a focus. What do you envision the Biden administration will do with some of these Trumpier policies and rules going forward? Yeah. So, like I mentioned, um, Attorney General Garland has uh, revoked several precedent decisions. That's the start. Um, you know, I, I think the Biden administration is tied in a way that the Trump administration was tied the same way. Was immigration law has been fundamentally the same since 1997 during the last passage of the illegal uh, IRA, 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 which is the last immigration kind of uh, reform we've had. And that one heavily based was based on the 1990 Reform Act. So really, immigration law hasn't changed much in 31 years. And so what can the Biden administration do alone? Not much, right? I mean, they can replace, um, you know, they've already replaced the head of EOIR. They have already, obviously have a new attorney general. So those policies can change. But the you know, fundamental or, you know, big reform is not going to happen without Congress. I mean, it's also going to come down to Congress. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously policy they can do. I mean, there's a border policy right now that's, you know, up to debate whether or not it's the proper policy or not. But that policies like that can happen and they can impact it. But a fundamental change is not going to happen under the Biden administration. It's not going to happen under any administration unless Congress gets involved. Yeah. And actually, um, one last question for you, um, Alex, and warning, this is off script. <laughs> but I, I recently listened to an NPR program where um, one of the panelists talked about how one of the fundamental flaws of the U.S. immigration policies that we tend to view migration as a general matter as a problem. Whereas if we approach it not as a problem, but as a normal state of affairs, because if you think about it, the U.S., for example, you know, attracts and, and retains a, a migratory workforce. You know, they're, they're only migrants working in certain mm -hmm. fields. And so in a way, our economy depends on their presence here. So what do you think about, you know, a, a migration approach that wouldn't view it as a problem, but would rather view it as, you know, an issue to be approached and, and, and sort of solved, but, but not as a problem? Yeah, or like a solution, right? I mean, I can give you an example for like employers. You know, think about like the restaurant industry, right? They'll, they call us all the time. They're like, hey, I got this chef. I need them to bring them to the United States. So I can't find a chef to work here in the United States. Great. It's going to take about two and a half years to get them here. Can you wait two and a half years? No. But I, we need to cook now. So the system is really set up to be this delayed. And it's, it is designed in a way to help the American worker, right? I mean, especially when you're doing kind of green cards based on that. But yeah, if you look at it as a a problem solver as opposed to a problem? Yeah, there is. I mean, it's, it's, it's just how the system set up is that we, we are restrict. We've always been restrictive to immigration. I mean, we have, we've had quotas. We've had refugee quotas. We actually have, we actually have nationality quotas. You know, we, it's funny in my, my class on Thursday, we were talking about something called the priority day in a visa bulletin. If you were to file for an application for your brother and sister and you're from wherever United Kingdom, about 13 year wait to get them here. You're from the Philippines or Mexico, about 30 years, 20 years. I mean, it really depends on your country. So there's, there's a quota system. I mean, we have a system that's designed to keep people out of the United States. And historically, we've had this before. We had something called the Chinese Exclusion Act, where we, we didn't want Chinese people to come to the United States. And we had an Irish Act like that. We've had all these acts to exclude people. It's always been a system historically to keep people out as opposed to bring them in. Yeah, India here also there's... India. There's India is for Indians who are coming to the United States to work who are based on their uh, education and background, there's the way the system's set up is we have a lot of them coming in, so we want to you know, give everyone else a chance. And well, that's fair. It's not fixing the problem, right? The employer doesn't really necessarily met, care about their nationality or background. They just need the best qualified people. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question of our panelists. Um, in the meantime, if you have questions, you can start formulating them you know, in your heads. And if you want, you can come up to the microphones. There's one microphone here and one microphone over here. So um, you, can, you can start getting ready for, for questions. So here's my last question to, um, to the panelists. Um, 
So in law school, we learn all these concepts. So for those of us who are in international law, human rights, you know, you take a class, you take a class on international law, you take a class on, you know, post-conflict constitutions, human rights. But what does it really look like when you're in the field? So, you know, Paul, let me start with you. Can you just share a little bit about, you know, you and I just recently went to Juba to uh, facilitate um, peace negotiations between Sudan and one of the rebel groups. What does it look like in the field? You know, it's, it's certainly very different from anything you've learned in the classroom, but what does it look like in the field? It's dusty. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots yeah. of mosquitoes too, right? Lots of mosquitoes in Juba. <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm glad you asked that question, um, Melania, because the field could be Geneva uh, at, at the Peace Palace. Uh, it could be the Rambouillet Chateau uh, outside of, of Versailles. It could be Juba. Uh, it could be, uh, Mike and I spent some time together in, in Tripoli and in, in Misrata and in, in Benghazi. Uh, we've also done work in uh, Yemen, in Sana, Sada, Taiz, uh, and Aden. And young professionals thinking about doing international law and, and getting into the field, it might be London, Paris, Geneva, uh, but it's likely to be, as my, uh, my South Sudanese friends always say, in the bush, um, and uh, lawyering in the bush, so to speak. And we use the phrase of putting briefcases on the ground or, or getting dust on our briefcases. And what you find in the field is there's an intense time and place for law, but it fits in with all of the other moving pieces of negotiating a ceasefire, negotiating a post-conflict constitution, negotiating a, a power-sharing arrangement. And when you're in law school, you're 24-7 law or when you're in a law firm practice, and we do a lot of pro bono work with uh, a lot of law firms do voluntarily pro bono work for us, is 24-7 law. Uh, and when you go into the field, a lot of politics, a lot of violence, a lot of military strategy, and then the moment when the law, when they turn and say, okay, now we're gonna put that uh, in writing. And, and one of the things, there's a, we have a ceasefire negotiator's handbook, and it was uh, a picture that was taken uh, um, in, uh, in Doha during the ceasefire negotiations. And there's a room full of, of our clients, the Darfur, uh, one of the Darfur non-state armed actors. And we were preparing to go into the ceasefire negotiations. And there, we're all there. And then there was me with my laptop open. And this is one of the value adds. As Melena said, reading the documents is a value add because everyone knows what the Security Council resolution says or what the previous agreement said, but they read it a really long time ago. The other value add that young professionals, young lawyers have is distilling the debate, the argument, the fierce political bargaining into words. And this was re referenced earlier today that Mike Scharf and Mike Newton in Uganda working on the PLPG project for the uh, war crimes creation, the clients get used to sharing all of their thoughts and ideas and positions, and then the lawyers distill it into something. That's what I was, I was distilling Drew's comments <clears throat> into something. Uh, no, uh, they distill it into something that then you give back to your client. And they're like, yeah, that's what we said. That's what we want to put on the table. And, you know, thanks for putting a few options in here. We're going to cross that one out. We're going to take this. Um, I had one client, um, Montenegro, working with Montenegro on the union treaty negotiations with, with Serbia. And I listed off four options. And I did this on purpose. And when I gave it to the chair, the chair said, uh, Professor, we have four options here, but we only have one delegation. And I'm like, yeah, your delegation has four options they want to present to the Serbian delegation. He's like, we are not doing that. We are picking one option because we're one delegation. But they hadn't sort of realized that in their conversation, they all sort of retired for the evening thinking, ah, we'd sorted out our position tomorrow that we're going to put on the table for the Serbian delegation. But they really hadn't sorted it out. And it took that skill uh, of a lawyer, uh, which is a simple skill. Um, to identify, but, but a very difficult one to actually implement, which is to distill all these themes of the position into one document that they can pick and sign and then put on the table. And the last, the last point I'll mention about being in the field, and it's, it's about being in the field, but for the, the young professionals, uh, it's, it's value add for the rest of your life. Get your draft on top first. If it's, if it's litigation, if it's a corporate contract, if it's a ceasefire, put your draft, your client's draft on top first, and then they start working 
from that from that draft. Uh, when we were in Dayton with the Bosnians, uh, we kept uh, redrafting whatever it is that the internationals would put on the table. Uh, and Michael Wood, uh, so we were here, Michael Wood came to us and said, are you going to do this every night? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, because we don't want the mediators to have the only draft on top. We want a Bosnian draft as well. And he was like, oh, this is going to take forever. <laughs> but it was the idea of empowering the client by having their words on paper that they could point to uh, as well. And Paul, I think you'd agree with me on this one. So you want your draft on top, but if you're eating at the buffet, you don't want to take the top plate. You want to take the middle plate because that top plate, you don't know how long it's been sitting there. And last thing you'd want is to get sick on, you know, day one of peace negotiations. Um, Drew, um, how about, you know, some of your experiences from, you know, the field you were, you, you worked at various U.S. embassies across the world. What does that look like? Well, uh, my experience was the U.S. government the U.S. people were my clients. Uh, I was not a lawyer in the State Department except for one year when I took Paul's place in uh, the European office during the Bosnian conflict. But uh, I was there trying to bring the threads together um, when we had a particular issue, such as in Sri Lanka, um, with the change of the government in 2000. Uh, 14, uh, the Sri Lankans had been stonewalling efforts by the by the world to get them to address transitional justice mechanisms after the end of their uh, civil war. They consistently refused to do so. Uh, the uh, Human Rights Council was getting ready to sanction them. New government unexpectedly came in, and then it was drawing in all of the human rights work, drawing in the um, National Security Council, drawing in additional resources for development to encourage the new government to assist the UN Human Rights Council to reach a positive resolution. And they did. They uh, agreed to certain steps to be undertaken in order to address underlying causes for the conflict and to promote transitional justice. So my experience was uh, more working cooperatively with uh, NGOs with PILPG, for example, with uh, USAID contractors when we were given a particular problem, drawing all of those people in to further U.S. government policy. Thank you. Darren, you have also been, you know, in the field um, as part of the U.S. government, but also on behalf of the PILPG. Um, what has your experience been like? Yeah, I'll, I'll, care, I'll share just a, a couple of um, war stories that I think touch on uh, two key lessons that I've learned. Um, the first key lesson actually uh, parallels a comment uh, made on made on the former panel, which is really that your clients um, or the individual that you're advising, they're they're trusting you and they're looking to you for your judgment, right? And so your job is to not only be an expert, right, in the in the relevant area of the law, but your job is also to um, exercise uh, excellent judgment. And that relates to the second theme, which is be prepared for anything, right? Be prepared for anything, particularly when you're in the field in some of these post-conflict environments. So, so the first war story, uh, Milena, I'll share is kind of my first experience really being in the field and having a significant level of responsibility was uh, in 2007, as I mentioned, I was sent off, you know, as a young lawyer to be the embassy legal advisor in Baghdad. And so literally the day I landed on the ground um, was the day that uh, Saddam's executions, uh, our Saddam's execution took place. It, uh, it's a story that's very, extremely well detailed in Michael's book um, on Saddam's trial uh, and the aftermath. And as uh, is, is noted in Mike's book, it was a the execution was not carried out properly, right? And it, it resulted in um, kind of stories on the cover of the New York Times and in the press all around the world. And it fed this narrative, right, that had, you know, been, ex that existed among some, that the process of the trial of Saddam and his regime, who had undoubtedly committed um, extreme uh, atrocities, that the, that the process of accountability was really one of victor's justice, 
right? And, and that resulted from, you know, a botched execution, right? And so that's what I stepped into, right? That was my first job as a young lawyer was to, to help the embassy figure out you know, how to address this, right? And we, you know, we came up with some steps. We halted executions. The, there was a lot of backdoor um, negotiation. Um, and there was, uh, you know, some attempt to shore up the, the, the trial process that was taking place. Um, but I had no idea um, that, that that is what I would be walking into. And so it was uh, this process of being, expecting anything, Right. But also exercising judgment that that helped to get me through that and, and some other incidents. And then the PLPG context is, uh, as Milena mentioned, right, the process of working with uh, some of our clients in Juba, right, during the, the negotiation of that peace agreement um, and just realizing that, you know, as a young lawyer, your job is to advise your client, but you can't always control the pace of the negotiation or the um, the ultimate ability of your clients to reach resolution on issues. And so all you can do is provide your best judgment um, and, and hope that they will trust you uh, in the midst of these very uh, complex processes. And, and Alex, if you can walk us through, you know, f for you, you know, the field is really immigration court or perhaps, you know, interviews before asylum officers, if you're representing asylum clients, walk us through, give us a snapshot of what an immigration case look, looks like. In particular, for example, if you're representing a client um, who the U.S. government wants removed, as you mentioned, what does that actually look like? Well, it's <laughs> very, it's different, right? I mean, no case is really the same. I can just give you an example. I had a case on someone bringing up about Bosnia earlier, earlier. I had a case I started in 2007 that ended this past Wednesday. So we've been fighting this case for 14 years. Um, what's the process like? It's fundamentally unfair because the government controls everything, right? We don't have, we don't have discovery in immigration court. Um, like you would in a regular court, we have Freedom of Information Act requests, which are heavily redacted. Uh, we don't have rules of evidence in our court. Um, the government controls the entire court process. I mean, an immigration judge can't make a decision until the government says that person's background check's been cleared. Um, so what does the process look like? It's, that's what you're stacked up against, right? You're stacked up against lack of knowledge, lack of evidence, um, and you have a system where it can drag on for years. And you have people, in this case that we've actually been fighting for all this time, it ended on Wednesday with my client halfway through like seven hours of testimony going, I just want to get deported at this point. And he literally said, I'd rather die in my house back home than die inside of a courtroom. And he was just burned out. I've been waiting all this time. And then he was just like, that's how I'm ending this. Like, it was like a thud. <laughs> like you come back from court, I would fight this game. And that's literally how it ended. So I know you don't want to hear only bad news that you mentioned before. But when you do win something and when you do win an immigration court case, it's, all, it's a great feeling, right? Because the odds are so stacked up against you and your client. And winning that is huge. And we had one, Dean Sharf and I were talking about before. We had this one in give like a war story in a horrible situation. We had this case that we won on it was April 20th of this year. She was from Trinidad. She left Trinidad because she was raped and had a forced abortion by her uncle in Trinidad. Comes to the United States as a visitor and is here for some time, meets a gentleman here, and they end up getting married, and he's like this horrible guy, and she ends up leaving him, right? She reunites with like a long-lost aunt in the Chicago area, and that aunt's husband sexually abuses her. So she finds refuge in a church in the Chicago area, and this family takes her in, and they're like, hey, we're going to help you, kind of get you on your feet, et cetera, et cetera. Sadly, that husband sexually abuses her. So she, everywhere she's going, she's getting sexually abused, and eventually she's like, enough is enough. I'm not doing this anymore. And they said, okay. What they did is they drove her from Chicago, Illinois, to the Detroit-Windsor Bridge and dropped her off to Border Patrol and said, this, she's crazy. She's here illegally. She's causing havoc in her house. Blah, 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 right? Border Patrol takes her in, and they, she's got no criminal history, do her background check, and they give her what's called a notice to appear. Go see an immigration judge, right? Your court case is in Detroit, right? Well, she's homeless, and she has no representation, she has nowhere to go, and she's got a court case coming up, and they mail it to the address that she gives them at these people's house. Well, guess who's not going to give her a hearing notice? This family who sexually abused her, Right? So she misses her court date. When you miss your court date, you get deported on the spot. That's the situation. Judge shows up. You're not here. They ordered deportation on this, on this gal. So she comes to us. And she's now married to an American citizen. She has a deportation order. So you have to try to reopen this immigration court case. 
And she has a child who has like serious health issues, like beyond serious. Comes to us and we reopen her case in Detroit. Government objects to it, saying there's no hardship and the, the facts and the circumstances aren't really like unique, is the words that they used. And eventually a judge reopened it up in Detroit. We transferred the case down here in Cleveland and she got her green card April 20th. We won the case finally for the students did everything. It was an awesome experience, right? But think about it, if she didn't have this representation, had immigration found her, you know what they would have done to her? They would have picked her up and they would put her on a plane and sent her back to Trinidad, right? That's, how, that's the system, how it's set up. So winning something like that, I'm sorry, like, I feel like I'm making the room all horrible, but like, winning something like that, that's what the whole point of it is. I mean, I think it's in, in every kind of area of law. You, you represent your client the best you can, right? And all, you who are students here, I mean, like I was saying earlier, your reputation in, is what you have. And if you're honest with your client, you tell them, hey, these are what's, what's stacked up against us. That's, I, to me, that's the, the most important thing about being an attorney is being brutally honest, not sugarcoating it and telling them, hey, these are what we got. These are our options. We're going to do the best we can for you. And if it works out, it works out. But I don't know. That's, I, hopefully it's an uplifting story. She's won. She got a green card. She's here. Everyone's happy. And you know, she'll be a citizen three years from now. Thank you. Um, again, I encourage you, if you have any questions, please come up to, to the microphone. But if not, I, I do want to end on a positive note, and that, that is actually a great right. story. Yes, no, that, that is, uh, you know, congratulations to, your, um, to you and your students for winning the case. I would like to ask our panelists, starting with Paul, to perhaps share a fun field story with us. I'm sure you have many, but if you can pick something, you know, fun and uplifting, how about that? It's been a long day. <laughs> All right, a fun, and, a fun and uplifting story. Um, when we were... Uh, negotiating uh, the Rambouillet negotiations. Uh, we had discovered the joy of compare documents uh, and the joy of interacting with, uh, with the news media. And the, uh, the Bosnians, uh, sorry, the Kosovars uh, had gotten their draft on top first, uh, which was about, you know, about, about 20 pages. Uh, and this was the draft that, that the internationals had, had agreed they would begin to work from. Um, the Serbian delegation um, didn't really like most of what uh, the Kosovars had proposed, and instead counterproposed a, a four-page, a four-page draft. We were a little punchy. We were a little bored. So we did a compare and contrast between the two documents, which showed you know line edits to those four pages, and then you know crossing out the other the other twelve pages. You know the human rights annex, the the voting annex, <laughs> the the reform of the police annex. Um, and then we happened to leave it on the table where the press corps <laughs> would come in and pick up their uh, their press releases for the day uh, as basically the counter proposal of the of the Serbian government. Um, and then it got put out in the news that there was a um, a counter proposal to basically cross out most of the human rights provisions. Now, of course, the Serbian delegation was completely bananas because they hadn't actually affirmatively proposed that. They just proposed a shorter a shorter proposal. Um, but the Kosovars were interested in sort of shifting the uh, the momentum a little bit. So I don't know if it's a happy story, but it was certainly a fun story in terms of a way of kind of, you know, taking the underdog client, uh, using a little compare and contrast with the two word documents and then getting it out to the media who were a little bored after 10 or 11 days and wanted something to, to get out there and, and spice it up. Um, and of course, they all looked at the lawyers because we were the ones who had the documents on our computers. <laughs> we're like, what? Not sure what you're talking about. Thank you. Drew? Gosh, way back in 1997, 98, um, there, uh, it was during the Sri Lankan Civil War, and a private had been picked up with a couple of other privates up in the north, um, where the Sri Lankan government uh, military had recently retaken the Jaffna Peninsula from the Tamil Tigers. And there were over, there were quite a few disappearances. And there were uh, rumblings of things that had happened, but nobody, nobody could find out what had happened. Well, he, in the midst of his trial, which was public, uh, made the assertion that he knew where uh, some mass graves were. And the government initially said, oh, that's fine. We'll investigate. Don't worry. Um, the United States government uh, and the embassy um, decided to push, 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 push. I had developed a, a friendly relationship with one of the young attorneys in the attorney general's office. And so he had said, well, you know, you're a good guy, Drew. Um, we'll arrange to let you come up 
and observe what's going to happen, the, the exhumation. In the meantime, the United States government uh, marshaled forces in order to provide um, international forensic uh, pathologists to participate and help train the Sri Lankans in their, in their exhumation. Um, so I went to my other colleagues in the diplomatic community and said, you know, if they let me go, then they probably would have to let you go. So why don't we organize um, a sort of a, an effort for there to be a diplomatic representation during the entire time of the exhumation so that nothing untoward could happen because there will always be diplomatic eyeballs. Um, and they were quite surprised, the Sri Lankans were quite surprised when the German embassy called up and said, well, we'd like to show up too. And then the Dutch embassy and the Canadian embassy and the Australian embassies. So we were able to um, ensure that there was sufficient um, oversight into what was going on. Uh, the United States government was able to provide uh, additional training. Uh, ultimately, the United States government provided DNA analysis after almost 10 years. Um, but they were able to identify uh, the remains of the 13 people who were uncovered. So that's a positive story. Thanks. Baron? Yes, I think um, just a, a nice success story from the field um, that comes to mind is, is the work that uh, PLPG has been doing with our clients in Sudan for quite some time, right? Clients who had uh, experienced uh, the atrocities in Darfur, right, in the two areas and other, other parts of the country, um, and who had organized uh, themselves politically, right, to participate in negotiations. And the fact that it was a people-led revolution, right, that finally toppled Bashir and created space for the peace agreement that was signed almost a year ago today. And it was just very powerful to see those same clients, you know, in the room negotiating peace and to see, you know, women and others who had been victimized by Bashir in the room you know, sharing their their views and to see uh, some of the same people who had been um, oppressed who were now part of the civilian led transitional government. And so it takes time, um, but there are uh, circumstances in which uh, peace does uh, seem to prevail. And so th that's one that comes to mind. And Alex, you just shared a very, you know, positive experience and, and a case you want. Anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be brief. I always kind of funny stories. I'm, I'm, I'm actually ethnically Serbian too. So my name is spelled like Alexander with a K and an S very much longer. Um, and one of my partners in our office in North Carolina represented this artist and they won this case down there and she painted this like picture of him, like a self portrait. And he was always bragging about this picture. And so I represented this one guy one time who was from Venezuela. He was detained during his proceedings and during his proceedings, his wife was pregnant and his wife was Puerto Rican ethnically. And we win the case. You figure, usually when you win your case, you don't see your clients for several years. And like a couple months later, they come rolling in with this like baby in a stroller. And I'm like, and they're like, oh, look at the baby. And everyone's like, all happy to see this little baby. And they named their kid after me. Right. And I remember looking at them, I was like, you're like Venezuelan and Puerto Rican. With, with the KS? With the KS, exact same spelling and everything. And so I remember like calling my the partner in our office. I was like, get a painting. I got a baby. <laughs> got a baby named after me. So that's a great story. Um, do we have a question? Yeah, I did have a question. Um, I was just curious how PALPG's work sort of in like negotiating ceasefires in a constitution, how you guys can use that to sort of, I guess, springboard, for lack of a better term, into building institutions in a post-conflict society and sort of ensuring transitional justice. Paul? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked that question because the, the clients, and in particular, the mediators are all about getting to yes now um, and getting to yes now with the guys with guns. Uh, let's just, you know, here, sign this. This is the menu from this morning. We made a few scribbles. Let's just sign it, agree, announce a ceasefire, uh, and we're good. And then once you've got that announced, there will be a cessation of hostilities and things will move forward. Uh, people actually read these documents. After they after they sign them, uh, and especially the non-state armed actors and the government actors, uh, you know, Drew was mentioning the uh, the uh, Sri Lanka. 
the ceasefire in Sri Lanka was was poorly negotiated, it, it, at least from the perspective of the LTTE. Uh, it provided that the government was able to protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. Seems perfectly reasonable and normal. Uh, well, when the Tamils had their armed shipments interdicted, they said, look, you know, it says you can't, you know, resupply your weapons. That's illegal. All the while, the Sri Lankans were retooling, building an air force in order to protect their sovereignty and territorial integrity. You know, words matter. There was a, 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 um, an imbalance in the way that the words were drafted. If you're looking to have a genuine, we've talked a lot about Bosnia. You know, Bosnia, the Dayton Accords were a getting to yes agreement 25 years later, and there's still political dysfunction because of the compromises that were made for this temporary constitution that would only last two or three years, but would allow NATO troops to come in and replace the UN peacekeepers. Let's get to yes, let's get to now. Just sign the document. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, but you've, you've instilled political dysfunction. Uh, Darren, as he mentioned, is deeply involved in the 200-page peace agreement for Juba for, for Sudan. Dan, a lot of thought went into those institutional structures. And the parties realized after decades of conflict, they wanted to get it right. And you've actually had a surprisingly functional, uh, for any post-conflict society at the moment, uh, in, uh, in Sudan with the Sovereign Council and the transformations that they're, that they're making. So the words matter, lawyers matter, get it in writing while you've got the attention of the international community. We have one time for one last question. Go ahead. We can hear you. Testing, okay. <laughs> so for those students and others in the room that are very interested and inspired by much of the work you all have talked about, and I understand PILPG has some limitations in terms of internships or fellowships being remote and things like that, but whether through PILPG or other avenues, how would you recommend, you know, we might move more into this area of um, post-conflict, peace, reconciliation, peace negotiation, all of that. Thanks. Paul? <laughs> so, I anticipated this question a little bit. Um, you're already in that environment and that area. And the task, you have, to, you have a twofold task. Um, let me back up. I was raised uh, by an engineer. You applied for things, um, and the, the notion of sort of building a network, building a career, building a profession uh, was not how engineers how engineers did it. And Melina and I were talking earlier today about about engineers. You get your degree, you apply for jobs, and you become an engineer. Doing peace negotiations, doing transitional justice, doing lawyering peace. Because you're already here at Case Western with the phenomenal programs, the phenomenal professors, the phenomenal internships, you're already in the mix. It's thinking strategically about how you can continue to expand your network, your relationships, your experience, coupled with deepening your skill set. You don't actually apply to these things. You show up with a skill set the writing, the, the, the clear ability the, the, to convey your thoughts. One of the, one of the notes I had that, that I'll use this question to, to give an answer to is one of our clients is a cardiologist. Another one's an industrial engineer. Another one's a dentist. Another one was an investment banker. These are all foreign ministers or heads of negotiations. I don't think I've ever had a client that was an international lawyer. Maybe I had an immigration lawyer, of all things, that was a client once. Um, and he had gotten put as the lawyer on the, on the PISTA delegation because he was a lawyer. He's like, Paul, oh, I'm an immigration lawyer. <laughs> you know, I know the client, but I don't know, I don't know the issues. Um, and so having the skill and then doing some time uh, at the State Department in the legal office, or even as a, as a, foreign, as a foreign service officer, uh, doing some fellowships with the United Nations for the Europeans in the room, the European Union, um, and staying in the community. Even if you go to big law, big law, we have 12 of the top 15 firms do pro bono work for, for PILPG. Um, we have, you know, huge numbers of hours that the firm's young professionals do. And oftentimes they'll use this to continue to develop their skills and their expertise and their street cred in this field. And then they'll pop from the firm into, onto an envoy's team or into the UN or into the state department or something along those lines. So it's, it's a little less precise advice than you might've been seeking, but 
but there isn't a pathway. I started out to be a water lawyer. My first law review article is on the protection of in-stream values in California, buying water and leaving it in the river so that the fish and wildlife can prosper. And I pivoted from that to State Department and then from State Department to, to peace negotiations work. It's having the skills and it's being constantly in the mix of, of international law, human rights, peace negotiations, and then making use of those opportunities. When anyone presents uh, an opportunity, the answer is always yes. Um, one of my students, and this will, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave you, since we seem to be terrorizing everyone nowadays, one of my students asked a question on Tuesday about, you know, you give us all this advice, you know, <sighs> we're students, we're like, we're like slammed 24 seven. How are we supposed to fit this into our lives? And fortunately, my teaching assistant answered the question and said, you will never have as much spare time as you have now. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That was, that was the response. And it's just the notion, you just come to, come to learn to live with the fact that you're 24 seven engaged in what you're what you're passionate about, um, and then finding ways to continue to stay um, engaged. And you have a lot of opportunities to blog and to intellectually engage, much, so, much more so than when we were entering the, the, the environment. Um, you can speak your mind on, from an intellectual perspective on a lot of these topics now in many different forms. So take advantage of, of doing that. And you know, I'm glad Paul mentioned water law. Paul and I spent a lot of time in Juba together at this last peace negotiation. And Paul was very excited one evening to tell me all about water law. And finally, I'm like, Paul, I do international law. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> I had to tease you, Paul. <laughs> um, really I managed to work it into the conversation. Yes, right? you love water law. <laughs> yes. Um, very quickly, um, Drew and Darren, if you have one uh, piece of advice for the students, if they're interested, for example, in pursuing a career in the Foreign Service or Darren, you know, working for the U.S. government. And then, Alex, you'll get the last word in terms of advice for students if they're interested in working in the area of immigration law. If you're interested in the State Department, it's not just the Foreign Service, but we do have a number of specialists for uh, the Civil Service. You should check out careers.state.gov, um, which for the United States government, for the State Department, is a remarkably informative website about information and avenues for pursuing internships and careers within the State Department. There's also a diplomat in residence headquartered at the University of Michigan, but responsible for Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Um, that person, Lou Finter, um, I used to have that job, um, so I know a little bit about it. That person in effect, ride circuit and visits. When I was when I was a uh, diplomat in residence, I visited Case Western. I visited uh, Cleveland State uh, for career fairs and things like that. You have specific questions first. Check out the website, then contact the diplomat in residence. There are a lot of opportunities out there, um, and the person will be able to help guide you as you sort of sort through how to find a job uh, in the State Department or USAID or sometimes uh, also other international organizations. The State Department supports Americans who try to find jobs in UN organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Darren? Uh, j just quickly, uh, I'll just say something about uh, finding jobs with the US government generally. Um, you know, the Foreign Services, as Drew mentioned, has a, you know, has its own Foreign Service exam. But if you're looking to um, join a U.S. government agency as a civil servant, um, USA Jobs, you know, uh, look at USA Jobs regularly, look for the opportunities that are presented. Th this is general advice. Then there are some more specific programs like the Presidential Management Fellows Program um, that provides opportunities to get a, a first job in the U.S. government. And then uniquely for all of you um, who are lawyers, right, that's, a, that's another process um, to get into the U.S. government. And what I normally tell folks is even if you apply for a job through USA Jobs, um, going back to what Paul said, the networking is key, right? Making sure that you know someone uh, in the office that you've applied to so that they can you know, make sure that your your application is seen is key. Uh, and um, I'll leave it there, but I'll just simply say I'm always happy to, to speak to students. So if anyone um, would like to follow up after this with any questions, I'm um, happy to speak with you further. And Alex, you have the last word. Thank you. So like, in terms of immigration, uh, like you were saying, networking. Uh, immigration law is a very small kind of community, so networking with immigration attorneys. Uh, there's also opportunities with pro... Um, pro bono, non-profit uh, refugee resettlement agencies in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. 
uh, students who are here. There's a fantastic immigration clinic at Case Western, a fantastic professor if you want to enroll in there too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, that, that's a wrap. Please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for coming. So we've neared the end, or we're at the end. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you all, particularly those of you who, uh, who have stuck it out the entire time. Um, it's really been a, a terrific day. Um, first off, just a, a few words of, of thanks to, to all of you uh, for being here. To, to our many guests who came from a variety of spots, uh, thank you for uh, braving uh, the, the elements, as it were. Um, uh, but I want to give a, a special thanks to a few people, uh, in particular, uh, the, the law students for the Journal of International Law, uh, and in particular, uh, Ali Narani Dargiri, uh, who many of the speakers have gotten to know. He's been hounding you uh, and, and, and seeking out uh, your work uh, and really has done a great job of, of steering this event. Um, thank you to Gabe Kaufman, who's been in the front, uh, making sure you're all uh, talking uh, in, in proper, succinct fashion. Uh, and also to Caroline Cirillo, our editor-in-chief of, of the journal. Um, a big thanks uh, to our dean, to Michael Scharf, for, for, for really leading and stewarding this event. Uh, a thank you to, to all the staff uh, who really helped put this together, and in particular, Eric Seiler, who's out there. I don't know if we can make sure he can hear us, but Eric really did, did a, a phenomenal job of, of just taking care of everything administratively and making this happen. Um, just really, I promise, a very, very few quick words. Trying to sum up, and I don't know that I can do justice to this. And thank you to this last panel, because when I was out before, a few people were feeling a little glum uh, about things. So uh, notwithstanding much of the difficult and sobering work that you do, um, also, I think, really inspiring uh, as well. Um, so the ICJ statute, Article 38, uh, certainly my students I know know this, provides that the court will apply the, quote, teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law. Uh, and as of 2017, I think there's, there's over 1,200 writers uh, who, who have been cited. Um, and in looking at these teachings, many of them are from uh, members of the academy, these writings, the court is looking for evidence of the law. And while being cited by the court is no doubt a highlight for, for any academic, uh, we in the academy, and I think as was evidenced here today, do not look solely to document the evidence of the law. Today's conference evidenced what is best and most inspiring about the academy. Far from being just academic in the sense of theoretical or hypothetical, we've learned today of how the academy can truly be a catalyst for change and innovation. We've heard from professors who are working in the field in myriad ways. Uh, it brings to mind Immanuel Kant's observation, practice without theory is blind, and theory without practice is empty. While we all write articles and books and blogs, it's never, for pretty much all of us, uh, here just a matter of theory. The work the members of the Academy also engage in, as we have heard, do not merely aspire to citation by the International Court of Justice, though it, of course, wouldn't be too shabby a thing to happen. Um, a number of people brought up, you know, very powerfully the, the, the personage of, of Raphael Lemkin, um, who, who worked tirelessly in the 1930s for a vision uh, of accountability for, for, for genocide, genocide being uh, made into a crime. Uh, and he tragically, as, as people noted, lost, uh, you know, some 50 relatives uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, but he found refuge and, and a home in, in American law schools for several years, where ultimately the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide was realized. Uh, may the Academy always have such a legacy. As we heard today, professors are not engaged in a mere academic exercise, but are taking part in direct representation, overseeing documentation and reports of the Rohingya, leading and taking part in international law commission reports, directing peace talks, pushing forward new conventions, leading NGOs, critiquing the law, proposing amendments to war crime statutes, leading civic education efforts on international humanitarian law and international human rights law, fighting for asylum, prodding and pushing 
at the formation of Opinio Juris, documenting state practice, advocating reforms of the UN Security Council, engaging in government and military legal advisory and representative roles. The work described today reflects the dynamic nature of international law in all of its transnational components, one that demonstrates that while, as some people noted, we do operate in a positivist consent-based system of international law that might still favor state interests, there is a role for the lawyers and the academy. That is, we, spurred by all that is best about the academy, rigorous, analytical, and thoughtful study, are unwilling to simply restate what the law is, but instead think forward what the law ought to be. Mark Ellis offered us a sobering reminder that many of the legal successes in human rights and humanitarian law that we have seen over the last 75 years are not fixed, that there are nationalist and populist interests afoot that may result in slippage and even an upward movement to authoritarian international law. Mark called for a civic education initiative that may result in greater understanding and securing of human rights, justice, and peace. I'm heartened by all the members of the academic community here, students, professors, lawyers, activists, that we can be a part of this education and be, as our conference title indicates, a catalyst for change and innovation. Thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend.